Well, if you've got your Bibles with you, whether it's a hard copy or electronic, open them to Exodus chapter 8, 8th chapter of the book of Exodus, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 10, but I want to start with verses 1 through 7 of Exodus chapter 8. You see, the Scriptures record for us that the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go, that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. The Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house, into your bedroom, onto your bed, into the houses of your servants and your people, into your ovens and your kneading bowls. The frogs will come up on you and on your people and all your servants. The Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the canals, and over the pools and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land. But the magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Now we're going to pause there, so keep your Bibles open. But I want you to picture this with me, if you would, please. Verse 2 tells us that the frogs covered the whole country. In other words, this was not just a localized event. This didn't happen just in and around the palace. This was a national crisis. Verse uh, 6 tells us that the frogs covered the land. That verb to cover, guys, literally means to blanket. Think about it this way. You go on a picnic with your family. You lay out a blanket on the grass. Wherever that blanket is, you can't see the grass underneath it for the blanket that is on top. So verse 6 of Exodus chapter 8 is telling us that the frogs literally blanketed the land. In other words, everywhere you looked, from corner to corner across the entire nation of Egypt, you could not see the ground underneath. 62 very hot frogs just came pouring out of the oven. It's the end of a very long, hard day. The frogs made your job almost impossible. You're tired, you're wiped out, you're exhausted, you get home late, everybody else has already gone to bed, you shut the lights off, lock the door, you head down the hallway towards the bedroom, you see the form of your wife already under the covers trying to get some sleep, you finish getting ready for bed, you move over to the bed, pull back the covers to discover it's not your wife, it's 187 frogs staring you in the face. It's mid-afternoon, two guys are sitting on a park bench trying to have a conversation, they have frogs in their laps, frogs in their shoulders, frogs in their heads. One guy reaches up, grabs a frog, puts it down only to have another one come up and take its place. And by the way, those frogs weren't domesticated creatures. They, they didn't wait to use the litter box, okay? Just, just saying, just saying. And, and you do realize that frogs are not quiet creatures. So the noise nationwide had to have been deafening. And if that's not enough, in verse 7, we have Frogs 2, the sequel, because Pharaoh's magicians duplicate everything that Moses and Aaron had done. So now we have, watch this, a blanket of frogs on top of a blanket of frogs. Oh, but wait, (laughs) it gets better. Uh, Historians tell us that during that time frame, the Egyptians worshipped a frog goddess by the name of Hequet. She was known as the goddess of fertility. So because they worshipped a frog goddess, understand, guys, that meant they could not kick, they could not throw, they could not... Get, do anything to those. They couldn't even enjoy a, a di- dinner of sautéed frog legs lest they offend their God. The simple task of walking from point A to point B was not so simple anymore. You might step on, you might squish your God. So you had to shuffle along and gently nudge your God out of the way. Now in the midst of all of that, look at verse 8 in our text, Exodus chapter 8, verse 8. You see, Pharaoh calls Moses and Aaron And he says, plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I'll let you go and worship. Now, again, keep your Bibles open. I I just want you to think about what we just read. Pharaoh calls Moses and Aaron into the royal chambers, and he says, all right, guys, that's it. I'm done. I've had enough. Ask your God to get rid of these frogs, and I'll let you go and worship. Now, on the surface, sounds pretty good, right? If you didn't know the end of the story, you might just think that Pharaoh's finally getting his act together. I mean, that's what Moses thought. Look at verse 9. Moses says to Pharaoh, be pleased to command me, when am I to plead for you and for your servants and for your people that the frogs be cut off from you and your houses and be left only in the Nile? I can almost see Moses grinning from ear to ear thinking, this is finally it. We're going to be free. We're going to be let go. 
And he says, Pharaoh, I am so glad that you want these frogs gone. I am thrilled that you finally realize the pain and the misery that these critters are causing not just you, but everybody around you. Pharaoh, I'm ecstatic to hear you finally admit that only God can remove these frogs from your life. In fact, Pharaoh, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to help you save face with your people. I'm going to give you the honor. I'm going to give you the privilege of determining when. When do you want God to step in and remove these frogs from your life? Now, guys, i got to hit the pause button for just a moment because Pharaoh's response to Moses just blows my mind. Look at verse 10. What is his response? When does he want God to remove the frog? Shout it out. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Are you kidding me? I, I, I can just hear Pharaoh saying, oh, Moses, I am so glad that your God is ready to get rid of these frogs from my life, but I'll tell you what, Moses, I want one more night with the frogs. One more night with the frogs. Let's have God deal with the frogs in my life tomorrow. Oh, don't, don't misunderstand me, Moses. I know the frogs are bad. They stink. They're unclean. They're unhealthy. I, I know they're making everybody miserable. You wouldn't believe the complaints that have been pouring into our administration since these frogs arrived. But I just want one more night with the frogs. Let's have God deal with the frogs tomorrow. May I suggest that we not judge Pharaoh too hastily? Because truth be told, we're just as guilty. You see, the fact is, guys, every one of us have frogs in our life. Let me explain what I mean. By frogs, I'm referring to frequently recurring obstacles to growing spiritually, F-R-O-G-S. Frequently recurring obstacles to growing spiritually. We all have sin issues in our life, things that are making us miserable, things that are getting in the way of our spiritual growth. They're affecting not just us, but those that we love, those that care about us. We love our frogs. In fact, I want to go so far as to say every man in this room right here and right now has at least one frog in your life. There, there's at least one sin issue that you're holding on to. It's, it's, it's become your own little frog goddess. And guys, watch me now. If you don't deal with that frog, if you don't get rid of that frog and allow God to take his rightful place on the throne of your heart, then I assure you, I promise you, I guarantee you that just like the frogs in Egypt, your frogs will multiply. They will begin to cover. They will begin to dominate. They will begin to rule over every part of your life. In fact, here's what I want you to do. Every one of you should have received a green sheet of paper that says, my frogs. Would you please pull that sheet of paper out if you don't have it already in hand? Grab a pen or a pencil. Beg, borrow, don't steal. We're in church. You don't want to do that. But I want you to take that pen or pencil, and I want you to take just a moment right now and write down the frogs that are in your life. I want you to answer this question. What sin or what sins am I holding on to until tomorrow? I want you to answer this question. What sin or what sins do I know I need to deal with? They've been plaguing me. They've been hounding me. They've been dominating my life. They're hindering my growth, my spiritual walk with God. They're affecting and impacting my family and my friends, those around me who care about me the most. Write down those frogs. Now, I, as I look across the, the auditorium, I'm seeing many of you writing good. Some of you are sitting there looking at me like a deer caught in the headlights. You want me to do what? <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you want me to write my sin issues down right now on a piece of paper so that the guys around me can say, I know what my, my frogs are. I'm not going to write them down. If that's your thought process, let me share with you just a couple of things. First of all, let me remind you that the guys sitting next to you have frogs in their life. If they want to lean over and look at your list of frogs and judge you, shame on them. And they will have to answer to God for that. The second thing I want to share with you is that this. If this is your thought process, yeah, I know what my frogs are. I'm not going to write them down right now. For the sake of an exercise that we're going to do in just a few moments, I'm going to ask you to write down at least one frog. And I've got the suggestion of what I think that frog should be. It's a word that's very difficult to pronounce. It's hard to enunciate, so I'm going to spell it for you. So I have pen and paper ready. And this, this is the frog, I think, that, that you need to write down. It, it's spelled this way. P-R-I-D-E. 
Let me give you just a couple more seconds and just take a moment. And it'll make sense to you in a moment why I'm having you do this, but write down those, those frogs that are in your life that you're holding on to till tomorrow. Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at your list. Don't lean to the left. Don't lean to the right. Don't lean forward. Don't twist around to the back. Look at your list. I want your, your frogs right now to stare you in the face with all of their warts and all of their ugliness. And as you're looking at your list, as you're looking at your frogs, I want to ask you to consider this question. What is so special about those frogs that you're willing to put them in the place of God in your life? What are those frogs doing for you that God cannot or will not do? Why are you so willing to sacrifice a closer walk with God? Why are you so willing to hurt those around you who care about you just so that you can have one more night with those frogs? Why are you waiting till tomorrow to get rid of them? In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 13 through 15, we see that we are to fear the Lord our God. We're to serve him only. Don't follow the other gods. Don't, don't follow your frogs, if you will, guys. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God. I want to challenge you right here and right now. Take advantage of what's transpiring throughout the entire day today. I don't want a single one of you to take your frogs home with you today. I, I want you to deal with the frogs that are in your life, those sin issues that you've been holding on to until tomorrow. Let's get rid of them. Don't spend one more night with the frog goddesses in your life. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 3, speaking to the whole house of Israel, Samuel says this, If you are returning to the Lord your God with all of your heart, then rid yourself of the foreign gods. Get rid of the frogs, guys. And commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you. Again, grab your Bibles. And this time I want you to go to the New Testament book of Luke chapter 9. Ninth chapter of the book of Luke. And as you're turning there, I want you to consider this question with me. Why do we wait till tomorrow to get rid of what we know we need to get rid of today? Why are we choosing to hold on to those frogs? We know we need to get rid of them. There, the Holy Spirit has been convicting you about those frogs. This isn't the first time that you've been feeling the prick in your heart. Why are you holding on to them? Somehow, in the back of our minds, tickles this little argument. I know I need to get rid of these frogs. I know they're making me miserable. I know they're hindering my walk with God, and I'm going to do it. I, by golly, I am going to get rid of those frogs tomorrow. I, I, I want to enjoy life for just a little bit longer. Then I'll, I'll be sold out for God. Guys, do you understand the error in that thought process? Can, can you see the lie, the subtle lie of the enemy weaving its way through those thoughts? You see, I'm wrongfully assuming that when I choose to live for God, when I choose to, to be sold out for him, I'm no longer going to be able to enjoy life. I, I, I'm somehow convinced that my frogs can bring me more joy than God can. But guys, I'm standing up here and I want to declare to you unequivocally, there is no greater joy. Watch this now. There is no greater joy than living a life that is sold out for God. Can I get a witness? And yet we wait till tomorrow. You need to choose, guys. Choose right here. Choose right now to live for God, to get rid of your frogs. Don't put it off until tomorrow. In fact, let me ask you a question. Consider this with me. When does tomorrow come? Tomorrow has a funny way of always being tomorrow and never today. In Luke chapter 9, we find what I call the three tomorrow men of Luke chapter 9. Would you look at verse 57? Luke 9, verse 57 Jesus and the disciples are walking along the road, and as they're walking on their, their little journey here, a guy comes up and he says to them, I will follow you, Lord, wherever you go. Now, hit the pause button for just a moment. Doesn't that sound great? Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. This guy gets it. It's worth following the Lord. 
Now, I, I don't know what, what stirred him to make that declaration. Now, maybe he heard the, the Sermon on the Mount and it just convicted him and he's ready to respond. Maybe it was just a Jesus groupie, like the things that he saw and wanted in on the action. I don't know what his reasoning was, but I do know that he made that powerful declaration, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And guys, I need to be honest with you that since the moment I was asked to keynote and, and I knew I was going to be sharing this message with you. I've been praying for every single one of you. Now, I don't know you by name, but God does. And I've lifted every one of you before the throne, and here's why. I want every one of you to walk out of these doors today and saying to God, no more frogs. I want you to walk out of here saying, Lord, I'm going to follow you unreservedly, unashamedly, totally and completely. I want to be sold out for you. So this guy makes this powerful declaration. How did Jesus respond? Look at verse 58. He said, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of God has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, Jesus is saying to this guy, all right, you want to follow me? Great, come on along. You're welcome to join us. But understand this, if you follow me, life is going to be hard. In fact, let's face it, guys, it's tough being a follower of Christ. Can I get a witness? It's hard being a follower of Christ. You want to follow me? Go ahead. But it's going to be tough. You see, we'd much rather have the easy life. So when given the choice between worshiping and serving and living for God or worshiping our frogs for just one more night, we, we tend to choose the frogs because they promise an immediate, albeit temporary, pleasure. And we're not guaranteed that God will do the same. That's the argument that goes on inside of our heads. Look at verse 59. Jesus says to another man, follow me. Okay, hit the pause button again. What happened to the first guy? Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. Great, come on along. It's going to be tough, but come on along. What happened to him? The Bible doesn't say, so I kind of surmise, I wonder if he had second thoughts about that commitment to Christ. I wonder if as he heard Jesus' response, he concluded, for right now, that's just a little too much for me. I wonder if he spun around on his heels and as he headed off, tossed back to the Lord, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll follow you tomorrow. Today, I want one more night with my frogs. Today, it's me first. Me first. Me first. Look again at verse 59. Jesus said to another man, follow me. Okay, again, I've got to hit the pause button because guys, consider this. The almighty, most holy, sovereign God, the creator of the universe in human form, looks this guy square in the eye and extends to him a personal invitation. Come on, follow me. What an honor. What a privilege. How did this guy respond? Look at verse 59. The man replied, Lord, first... Let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. You see, when confronted with the personalized call of God in his life, this guy chose to wait until tomorrow. His response was, all right, Lord, I'll, I'll do that, but today it's me first. You saw it in the text. Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Me first. Me first, I, I want one more night with these frogs, then I'll follow you. Verse 61 tells us that another man said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Who was sitting on the throne of this guy's heart? I'll follow you, Lord. You get the impression maybe it's about God until he continues and puts his foot in his mouth and says, but let me first. I'll follow you, Lord. I, I really will tomorrow. Right now, I want one more night with my frogs. It's me first, me first. See, in each of these accounts of these three guys of Luke chapter 9, King me is sitting high and mighty on the throne of their hearts. That's the focus, and where, what, where, what you think and what you focus is what you're going to worship. So guys, I want you to look at your list of frogs once again. Grab that green sheet of paper. Take a look at that list. I want your frogs again to stare you in the face. I want you to see just how ugly they really are. And I want you to start to consider this question. What am I going to do with these frogs? What is God calling me to do with these frogs? In Joshua chapter 24, verse 23, 
Joshua says to the children of Israel, throw away the foreign gods that are among you. Guys, throw away your frogs. Yield your heart to the Lord. These frogs that you're holding on to shouldn't be anywhere near you. I want you to notice that Joshua says, throw away, cast away, toss away. He doesn't say, set them down. If you were to set your frog down, the next time you face a temptation to sin, you might just reach down and pick up that frog again and, and begin caressing and holding on to it. You're to throw it as far away as you possibly can, so it's very difficult to get back to it. One more passage of Scripture I'd like us to go to, and that's Deuteronomy chapter 10. Grab your Bibles again and go to Deuteronomy chapter 10, and as you're turning there, let me read to you Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 and 16. You see, in Deuteronomy, verses 30, 15, De Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 and 16, God says this, I set before you today a blessing and a curse, life and prosperity, death and destruction. I command you today to love the Lord your God. Not your frogs, guys. Love God to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commandments, his decrees, his laws, and then tomorrow you will live and you will increase and the Lord your God will bless you. So I've got two questions I want to pose to you. I want you to shout out the answer. The first, they're both, the answer is very obvious, so you should do well with this. The first question is this, guys. When should you get rid of your frogs? Today, not tomorrow. Now, not later. The other question is this, again, shout out your answer. When should I choose to walk in full surrender and total obedience to God? Today, not tomorrow, now, not later. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, look at verses 12 and 13. It says this, and now, Israel, if I may, and now, guys. In fact, if I may, and now, put your name in there. God is speaking to you. So as I look at this, it's in now, Steve Etner. What, are the, what does the Lord your God require of you? What are the marks of a godly man? What are the marks of a man of integrity and a man of purity? He gives us five. Here they are. The first one is this. Fear the Lord your God. Guys, when are you going to do that? When are you going to get rid of your frogs and worship and serve God first and foremost in every aspect, every part of your life. Are you really going to wait till tomorrow? Number two, walk in all his ways. Again, I ask when. When are you going to choose to get rid of the frogs and walk in total obedience, full surrender to your heavenly Father? Are you going to wait till tomorrow? Number three, love him. Again, when, guys, when are you going to take King Me off the throne of your heart and sacrifice everything you have and everything you are for the one who gave it all for you? When? Are you really going to wait till tomorrow? Number four, serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. When, guys? When are you going to make every aspect of your life all about honoring and glorifying the one who gave it all for you? Number five is in verse 13. It's observe or obey the Lord's commands and his decrees. Again, I ask, when? When? Guys, when? Are you going to wait till it's convenient? Are you going to wait till you happen to think about it? Are you going to wait until it doesn't interfere with the TV show, the movie, or the ball game? Are you going to wait until it fits conveniently into your calendar? when it doesn't mess around with the other things that you want to do or achieve, when are you going to get rid of your frogs and live a life that is sold out for God? Look at your list again. Grab that list, that green sheet of paper, and hold on to it. I don't want you to let go until I tell you to. Those frogs that you wrote down, guys, they're not a blessing to you. They're a curse. Nothing good can come from these frogs. Get rid of your frogs today, not tomorrow. Get rid of the frogs now, not later. 
As you're holding that list in your hand, I want to quote to you the, what God told the children of Israel in Joshua chapter 7, verse 13. Listen to this. He said, get ready for tomorrow by purifying yourself today. There are cursed things in this camp. You will not be able to face your enemy until you've gotten rid of those cursed things. Now, here's what I'd like you to do. If you wrote down at least one frog on this sheet of paper, I want you to take that sheet of paper and I want you to fold it in half. Only if you participated and wrote down at least one frog, I want you to fold it in half. Once you've folded it in half, would you please take that list of frogs and hold it straight up in the air and keep it up until I ask you to put it down. Guys, I want you to take a moment, look around this room. This room, <clears throat> excuse me, this room is one heaving mass of frogs. While you're holding it up, listen again as I quote for you Joshua chapter 7, verse 13. Get ready for tomorrow by purifying yourself today. There are cursed things. There are frogs in this camp. You will not be able to face your enemy until you've gotten rid of those cursed things until you've gotten rid of the frogs. Okay, you can put it down. In a moment, I'm going to close in prayer, but before I do, I want to extend a rather unique invitation to you. If the Holy Spirit has been speaking to your heart about these frogs and you're realizing you need to get rid of them and you need to get rid of them now, if you're serious about making the choice and the decision to live a life sold out for God and you're going to do it now, then here's my invitation to you. As soon as we're done here in just a couple of moments, I'm going to ask you to find the nearest trash can, and I want you to rip up your frogs. And then I want you to take those, that torn up piece of, pieces of frog, and I want you to throw them away and symbolically hand them over to God. And then I want to encourage you to stop by my table. It's right outside these doors, and there's a box of little plastic frogs. There's enough for one for every guy here. And if you've made that commitment, I'm asking you to grab one of those frogs and commit to sticking it in your pants pocket and keep it there for the next two weeks so that every time you put your hand in your pocket, you'll feel that frog and it'll be a reminder of your decision today here at the No Regrets Conference to say to, to God, no more frogs. I'm going to live for you right here and right now. Precious Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to, to share with you, with the guys, your truth, your word, and may the Holy Spirit move mightily in our midst as we consider the frogs that we need to get rid of. We just lay this, this message and this conference before you and give you all the honor and the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.